Welcome back. Here we go. We're going to start our adventure in this more advanced chemistry and second semester general chemistry by talking about chemical kinetics. So we're going to talk about what is a rate, right? It turns out a rate is a fundamental thing when you're talking about chemical kinetics. What is it? How do we determine them? These things called rate laws. How is it that we're going to make some formulas, right? That's what we do in chemistry. We like formulas for things. We like to calculate things. Um, and this semester is all about numbers. So we're going to figure out how we're going to calculate these kind of things. So all about that rate law, zero order, first order, second order, what is that? We're going to figure out how temperature affects rate, reaction mechanisms. So, you know, you write these chemical balance reactions and you're like, oh, you know, CH4 and O2. But what actually happens? Like, does, does CH4 actually hit two O2 molecules simultaneously in order to make the carbon dioxide and water? Or what's actually happening on a physical, fundamental, chemical level? And this is the first time we're probably really talking about that. What are our reaction mechanisms in order to make a reaction work? So there's lots of stuff in this chapter, and we will uh, dive into it little by little. So the first thing we're going to talk about is kinetics. What is kinetics? You've talked about thermodynamics, which is the study of heat transfer, of energy transfer in reactions. And you said, OK, you know, this reaction is exothermic, and it happens. But what we didn't talk about is how fast does it happen. So kinetics really is the study of the rates and the mechanisms of reactions. Right, so really, how fast does it happen? Just because it can happen doesn't mean it'll happen very, very quickly. So how fast are we doing things? And we're going to start off by talking about it in a way that's probably a little more intuitive rather than thinking about these little tiny atoms that you can't see doing stuff that you can't really understand. We're going to talk about making some chocolate. Most people like chocolate. If you don't like chocolate, it's OK. You can still understand. So we're going to talk about making chocolates. And you know, if we're talking about the rate of chocolate production, Right? We've got this conveyor belt of chocolates. And what we want to know is, well, how many chocolates are we producing in an hour? Or how many chocolates are we producing in a minute? Or how many chocolates are we producing in a day? Um, I used to live down in New Zealand for a while in the Cadbury factory down there. You know those little Cadbury cream eggs? They start making those about a month after Easter for the next year because they can only produce so many for the tens and hundreds of millions of them they sell every year around Easter. So the rate of production of those chocolates is actually pretty important because it affects how they do their planning. So if we're going to talk about the rate of chocolate production, what you heard me say is things like, well, how many per day, how many per hour, how many per year are we producing? And so we can kind of generalize that and say the number of chocolates in this case, we're talking about chocolate kisses in this picture, not Cadbury eggs, produced over the time to produce them. So if we produce lots of chocolates very, very quickly, right? then we have lots of chocolates, big number for chocolates produced. And what would we have for how, how long it took to produce? Right? If it was very quickly, it would be a small time. And a very large number of a very small number gets you a very large number. So you know, a billion over one gets you a billion. So we'd produce a very large rate. Whereas at the same thing, you know, if we were sitting there and we were doing this and producing one chocolate at a time like that, right, we could still produce a billion chocolates. We could still have a billion up there on top. But it would take a really long time. Right? So we'd be talking about a billion chocolates in 10 billion hours, and you'd have a much smaller rate. Now, as chemists, as scientists, you know this is kind of a fluffy looking formula. So let's make it look fancier. How are we going to make it look fancier? We're going to define this thing called the rate. And we're going to say the, the rate is how fast we're producing it. And it's the change in chocolates over a change in time. And you remember the Greek letter delta is always final minus initial. That's a horrible A, so let me erase that for you. Initial. Right. Final minus initial. So if at the end we have a million chocolates, at the start we had zero, then we'd say one million minus zero would be our delta chocolates, or one million. If it took us 15 seconds, we'd say, you know, two. 223 in 15 seconds minus 223 in 0 seconds when we started, and that would be 15 seconds would be our delta t. So that's how we calculate that. But remember that delta is always, 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 
always final minus initial. You will find in some poorly written chemistry books that they occasionally in one or two formulas will say, well, in this formula, let's use delta as initial minus final so we don't have to use the negative sign. Don't do that. Delta, always final minus initial, and you'll always get the right sign. Okay? When you start, start thinking that sometimes I do it one way, sometimes I do it another, you're going to get the wrong sign, and signs are pretty important in some of this rate stuff. All right, so that's what we're going to do, is we're going to talk about rates as this change in something over a change in time. And we can talk about big numbers, little numbers, it doesn't really matter. It's that ratio that matters. How many we're we making per hour, how many we're we making per second, how many we're we making per year or decade, or whatever it is. So those units can change a little bit, but the concept of that ratio is going to stay the same. So if we are producing chocolates at a rate of 18 chocolates per second, how many are we going to produce in two minutes? And this is our first try at using the interactive video features. So the video is going to pause itself in just a moment and ask you to answer this question. You can take as long as you need to, and uh, you try to answer this question and see what you come up with. So I'm going to smile so you get to stare at a smiling face while it's paused. OK, so what did you come up with? Well, hopefully you said, well, I've got 18 chocolates per second, and now I'm talking about minutes, so I can't. I can't do that. I have to figure out that two minutes is equal to 180 seconds. And you know, you could do that as a conversion if you wanted, right? Actually saying 60 seconds per minute and all that kind of stuff. So great, 180 seconds. And then you'd say, well, I've got 18 chocolates per second, right? We have a rate, which is a change in chocolates, 18 chocolates over a change in time per second. And then I'm just going to go ahead and multiply that by 180 seconds, and you get 18 times 180. And if you take that and put that into your calculator, hopefully you get the answer of 2,160, 2160 chocolates is how many we'd produce in 180 seconds. So we're kind of getting this thing that if we take rates and we multiply by time, it's going to give us something about totals. That's an interesting thing. Rate chocolate, 18 chocolates per second times time gives me something about the total amount I'm making. So we'll see that going forward as well. All right, 2,160 chocolates. That sounds like a lot of chocolate. So let's use some more, okay? In order to make these chocolates, right, in order to produce all these lovely Hershey's Kisses, and by the way, the best Hershey's Kisses are the dark chocolate ones, just so you know. So we're going to make all these lovely dark chocolate Hershey's Kisses. Well, in order to do that, we've got to use up some chocolate, right? These kisses don't just appear out of nowhere. We've got that whole conservation of mass thing that we talk about in chemistry. If, you know, we're making 10 pounds of chocolate, what do we have to use? We have to use 10 pounds of chocolate in order to make that, right, assuming there's no waste. If there's waste, we need to, to produce more than that. Okay, so we said this was the rate on the right was delta chocolate over delta t, change in time, right? And that was what we defined the rate as that. And since we're producing chocolates, right? We have 10 chocolates now, we had zero chocolates at the beginning, 10 minus zero is a positive number. Time always goes in the forward direction, so our change in time is a positive number. And so we actually say, hey, this rate is usually going to be a positive number. And in fact, that's part of the definition of rate. Rate is always going to be a positive number. Now, we're going to use all sorts of other words and phrases with rate in them, and they don't all have to be positive. Okay, But rate is defined as a positive number. But we're using up chocolate in order to do that. And so we say, well, can we talk about the rate of using up chocolate? Right? I'm going to distinguish it by saying chocolate used over delta t. And can we just do that? Can we say, well, that one is equal to the other, right? Because we're making chocolate at 10 pounds per second, so we must be using up chocolate at 10 pounds per second. But we have to keep in mind, as we're using chocolate, right, we have less chocolate at the end than we did at the beginning. So at the end, we might have uh, uh, 90 pounds of chocolate, and at the start, we had 100 pounds of chocolate. And so my delta chocolate here is negative 10 pounds. Well, 
if I want my rate to be positive, then I can't have a negative in my numerator unless I have a negative in the denominator. But you know, time always goes forward, right? It took us 10 seconds to use that. And since it's always final minus initial, we can't just switch it in this one and be like, well, let's, let's in this case make the time one go backwards. No, time final minus initial, it took us 10 seconds. So what we do instead, since we want rate to be positive because it just does make life easier in the future, what we do is we just put a negative here. We say for things we're using up, so I put a negative right there. For things we're using up, we're going to put a negative sign in front of that so that a negative times a negative is going to be a positive. And my chocolate used is negative times negative 10 pounds per second. And so I get 10 pounds per second as my rate. The chocolate I'm making is 10 pounds minus zero pounds. So 10 pounds per second, 10 pounds per second. They're both equal to each other because I have to be using up chocolate at the same rate I'm making chocolate. And so that's an important distinction is that rate is defined as positive and that when we're talking about products, things we're making, the delta chocolate over delta whatever it is, which we'll see, over delta T is positive. And when we're talking about reactants, the things we're using up, we have to put that negative sign in there to take into account that we're using it up and that delta is going to be negative, but we want a positive rate because it does make our life easier in the future. All right. <clears throat> So how about if we plot that? We're going to do a lot of plots in this class. Lots and lots and lots and lots of plots. So let's plot that. If we are just making chocolate at a kind of fairly constant rate, which is kind of what you'd expect from a factory, right? You turn it on, it just kind of produces chocolate, produces chocolate, produces chocolate. What we're going to find is that the pounds of kisses we make, right? Let's say we're making roughly 100 pounds an hour. After one hour, we've made 100 pounds. After two hours, we've made 200 pounds. After three hours, we've made 300 pounds, etc. And at the beginning of that shift, we started with 1,000 pounds of chocolate. And in one hour, since we've made 100 pounds of kisses, we've now used 100 pounds of chocolate. And now we only have 900 pounds of chocolate available to us. And so we get these two straight lines that kind of cross in the middle. This line or this point looks like it's really meaningful. It's not really. It just happens to be where you've used as much as you've gained. But it's not particularly meaningful in and of itself. And then at the end of the day, we have no more chocolate left because we've used it all and we've turned 100 or 1,000 pounds of chocolate into Hershey's Kisses. So these very nice straight lines that we get when we're talking about it. Now, what's interesting is what happens if I look at the slope of these lines? If I look at the slope of a line, and luckily I have a 0, 0 as a point here on this line, which makes looking at the slope really easy. Let's pick this top right one. What is my slope? Well, it's 1,000 pounds minus zero pounds, right? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's going to be 10 hours minus zero hours. And if you do that, it's going to be 1,000 pounds divided by 10 hours. And if you do the math there, you get 100 pounds per hour. And that's what we said, right? We said, like, well, duh, you're, you're calculating the obvious because in an hour made 100 pounds, in two hours made 200 pounds. But what is this? What are the units pounds per hour? Well, gosh darn it, that's our rate. And what we just calculated is using the slope of the line of concentration. Oh, did I say concentration? That's what we're going to get to in a little while. Pounds of chocolate versus time. If we take the slope of that line at any time, it's telling us the rate. And right now we're talking about constant rates. We'll see sometime pretty soon that rates aren't always constant. But what we do when we do that is we get the rate. 100 pounds per hour is the rate at which we're using chocolate. So that's really cool. Slopes of lines of quantity versus time give us the rate of a reaction. Now all these lovely straight lines. Is that how life works? Well, have you ever poured out chocolate? You take a ladle of chocolate, you take a spoon of chocolate, okay? Is that constant? First, we're gonna answer this question. I forgot it was in there. That's why I was talking about other things. So if we're producing 270 milligrams per hour of a chemical product, what is the rate that we are using up the chemical reactants? So again, it's gonna pause in just a moment. It's gonna have you answer this one and then it's gonna move on and I'm gonna smile. Okay, so what did you come up with? Well, you're like, well, we're using that up. And so that's got to be a negative 270 milligrams per hour. In fact, even when I made this question, that was my first response. Was, oh, yeah, negative 270. Yeah, because, you know, we're using it up. But 
the word I used was rate. And what did we define? Rate is always positive. And so the rate is going to be the negative of the change in concentration. Here it's going to be mass over delta t. right? And yes, we are using up 270 milligrams per hour, but we still have to put that negative in front of it. And remember, rate's always defined as positive. And so negative times a negative is a positive, And I actually get positive 270 milligrams per hour. Okay? And we can tell that without a balanced reaction. We don't need a balanced reaction here. Since we're talking mass, there's conservation of mass that's helping us. Okay? So if we're making 270 milligrams of stuff, we've got to be using up 270 milligrams of stuff. Now, it's possible there's waste. Okay, but we're, we're assuming there's no waste right now. And a balanced reaction wouldn't tell us about waste anyway. So that's what we have to do. Remember, rates are always positive. Right, anyway, back to our spoon of chocolate. You take a ladle full of chocolate, you start pouring it. What happens? At the very beginning, it's pouring very quickly. A lot of chocolate's coming down. But over time, what happens to that chocolate? It slows down. A little bit less pours. Then it gets thinner and thinner. And then you start getting drips of chocolate. And what we find is that the amount of chocolate we're producing over time isn't constant. In that chart, a couple that slides ago, everything was constant. 100 pounds per hour, no matter when it was. Beginning of the shift, end of the shift, we were producing 100 pounds of chocolate. We were using up 100 pounds per hour of chocolate. But that's not always the case. Sometimes, as we go on, that rate that we're using things up, that rate that we're making things, goes down. Right? So if we were looking at a ladle full of chocolate uh, being dispensed, then we'd find that it goes down over time. And so what do we say? Well, we say that the change in chocolate over the change in time is not constant. When is it faster? Is it faster at the beginning or is it faster at the end? Yeah, it's faster at the beginning. When you're first pouring that chocolate, a lot of chocolate comes out. And if a lot of chocolate comes out, that means we have a faster rate. And at the end, there's a slower rate. So it turns out, not only can we say delta chocolate over delta time is not constant, we can say that it's somehow proportional to the amount of chocolate. When we have a large amount of chocolate, that delta chocolate over delta t is large. The rate is large. When we have very little chocolate, that rate is very small. And if you remember this proportionality here, if we, if we talk about this proportionality number here, that just means there exists a constant that makes them equal. So we could say that delta chocolate over delta t is equal to some constant. We don't know what the constant is. We'll just call it k times the amount of chocolate we have. That's what that proportionality means. And we're going to use that later on when we actually start to talk about some chemistry. So not always constant. Faster sometimes, slower other times. And we'll, in fact, see all sorts of different times when we've got things that are sometimes constant and sometimes not constant. There's all sorts of really, really, really cool stuff that's going to be going on in here. So it not only works for chocolate, it works for chemistry, too. And we're going to consider a reaction where we take a blue ball and we take a purple square. They're going to react. The square is going to come between those two balls and make this new little wonderful shape. So at the very beginning, we have all this stuff mixed together. We've got some balls, we've got some squares, and they're going to react. And let's just say that they react fairly easily. If when a, when a ball hits a square, it's likely to react. So we aren't, we aren't going to get into you know how often they're going to react and all that kind of stuff. So let, let's just pick one ball. We're going to pick this guy here. We're going to pick that ball. If we start time here, what do molecules do? Whether they're in gas or they're in solution, they just start bouncing around. It's just kind of this random thing we call Brownian motion in uh, 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 solution because they're all being hit by all the solution particles. Or you know, it's just straight kinetics, ding, ding, you know, straight line until you hit something for uh, gases because they don't hit things very often. But anyway, they're just going to be bouncing around. And the squares are going to be bouncing around too. So we've got this little circle bouncing around, hitting things, bouncing around, and the squares bouncing around. And as they go around, well, it turns out there's quite a lot of other squares around. So the chances of this circle finding a square is not small. And so this circle might find this square fairly quickly. This circle might find this square fairly quickly. This circle might find this square fairly quickly since they're kind of near each other. It's also possible they'll go away and do other things. But right, there's lots of chances to react when there's lots of people to react with. It's like if you were in a giant, giant stadium and there was one other person in there, it would take you forever to find them. 
right? But if there was a million other people in there, you just had to find somebody, you could find somebody pretty quickly. So that's the same kind of thing is going on here. So what we're gonna find is that this reaction is very fast at the beginning. There's lots and lots of reactions occurring at the very beginning, right? So <clears throat> our change in product, the thing we're making over a change in time is large at the beginning. Okay. What about if we change our scenario a bit? Okay. We're going to change it so not only do we have kind of this equal number of squares and circles, but we don't have very many circles to begin with. If we don't have a lot of circles, what are the chances that this guy is going to react? He's bouncing around, bouncing around. We say square, 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 right? That's all he's going to see. That guy's not going to react. What about this one, right? Bouncing around, he's square, 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 square. Mm, not much reacting going on. Now, this square, when he bounces around, he might find that circle that's near him. He might not, right? So he bounces around, he's square, square, square. Oh, finally a circle, right? But compare that to what we had over here, which is just about every other bounce. Right? Since there's roughly equal numbers and there's a lot of them, roughly every other bounce, you're finding somebody to bounce off of and possibly react with. And so in this first scenario, so I'm going to label them now, not just the beginning, at one. Okay, So that's number one. That first scenario, we have a very large rate. But for number two, delta product over delta t is going to be smaller. We don't know how much smaller, this is not quantitative, but it's gonna be smaller, right? There's less things to bounce into. And so certainly you're gonna find that there's less reactions happening. Let's look at case number three. In case number three, we're gonna take that same stuff and we're gonna put this in a giant, giant room like I was thinking about a stadium, right? Now, if there's some blues and some uh, squares, sorry, squ circles and squares bouncing around this giant stadium, and there's only a few of them, right? what are the chances they're gonna bounce into each other? Because it's not like they can find each other. It's not like they're gonna play Marco Polo. They're not gonna do that. Okay? They just have to find each other just by randomly bouncing. That's almost never gonna happen. And so in case three, our delta product over delta t is very small. We're not gonna be making much reaction here. So. When we've got a lot of things, right? We've got a lot of each one of them, high concentrations, right? That's what we call concentration, the amount of things in a given space. When we have a high concentration of our reactants, we're gonna get this kind of relatively fast reaction. When we have lower concentrations of a reactant or both reactants, we're gonna get slower. And if we have low of both of them, like really, really low, we're gonna get a very slow reaction. So what does that look like? Well, that looks like mathematically that the change in product over the change in time and notice how I'm using the square brackets now okay the change in the concentrate I forgot my change the change in the concentration of the product how much product do we have available but also given the space that we have is going to be proportional to the concentration of our blue circles and to our purple squares. Delta product over delta t is proportional to the concentration of the blue circles and the purple squares. Right? The more blue circles we have, the faster it seems like it's gonna go. The more purple squares we have, the faster it seems like it's gonna go, and vice versa. When we have very little of each low concentrations, we expect the reaction to go very slowly. And remember that proportionality just means there exists a constant, different k than our previous reaction, but we're just still going to call it k, times the concentration of blue, times the concentration of purple. And you'll notice, just so you know from my handwriting for the rest of the class, I almost always make my end square brackets look like a number three. I just, I just do, so just get used to it, okay? Um, I try, but I'm just, I just don't have the best handwriting in the world. So equals k times the concentration of b times the concentration of p. And we're starting to look a little more formal here, right? We're starting to look like something that looks like a chemical formula, chemical reactions, chemical equation, right? We've got concentration symbols and things like that, constants. It's looking a little more formal, and that makes sense, right? 
it makes sense. The more we have, the faster it goes. The less we have, the slower it goes. So let's let time go on. We're going to start with that same reaction we had before. Lots of circles and lots of squares, and we're going to let it react over time. So lots of circles. Let's say that these two react and make this guy. These two react and make this guy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, what do you find? Over time, now there's only four, right? There was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There were seven blues in one spot. Now there's only one, two, three, four. Four blues in the same size. We haven't changed the size of our container. So we went from seven blues to four blues. Our concentration went down. And down here, we're at, we're at only two blues left, okay? And just to confuse you, I'm writing two blues in green, okay? So, we're finding our concentration of blue is decreasing over time. And in this last slide, what do we say is, well, as our concentrations decrease, our rate goes down as well. And you'll find the same thing for the squares, right? Their concentration is going down. So as we react, as we make this product, we're using up our reactants. And we might find that this reaction changes speed as we go. And it might be expected that the reaction slows down as it progresses. And that's absolutely true. That's what most reactions are going to do. They're going to slow down as they progress. Now, the cool thing is there's some out there that don't. But most will, because you're using up those things. And well, if there's less of them, there's less chance that they're going to react. And so we're going to find a change in the reaction rate as we go. It's going to be really slow here and relatively fast here. right? And we don't know what fast and slow mean. We're not quantifying that yet, but certainly slower at the end than at the beginning. So what would that look like if we da -da -da -da, plotted it? Okay, We've got the same thing, pounds of chocolate over time, but let's say we're pouring it from a scoop as opposed to just producing it regularly. Well, as we pour it from the scoop, it's going to pour really quickly at the beginning. So we're going to go from 1,000 pounds down to eight or 700 pounds in the first hour. right? But in the next hour, maybe we're only going to go 200 more pounds. In the next hour, we're only going to go 100 more pounds. In the next hour, we're only going to go half that much. What we're going to find is a curve that looks a little like that. And, you know, it should be a little flatter towards the end there, but you get the idea, right? There's this big drop at the beginning, and it kind of flattens out over time. And so this is our, the green is the chocolate that we're using. It decreases very, very quickly at the beginning and slower and slower at the end as we're dripping out chocolate towards the end. What about what we're making? Well, if in the first hour we use 300 pounds of chocolate, by golly, we are probably making 300 pounds of chocolate in that first hour. And if we're using 200 in that next hour, we're probably there. And if we're using 100 in that next hour, we're probably there. And our curve on this side is going to look something like that. It's not perfect. It's not exactly what it's going to look like. But it's very different than this linear one that we saw before, just constant use of chocolate over time. Here, we're using it up very quickly, we're producing it very quickly at the start, and slower and slower at the end. And if you remember, we said something about the slope being related to the rate. And when we had a straight line, that was easy. Well, what about when you have this curved line? Well, it turns out there's a different rate at every moment in time. So I can't talk about the rate of this reaction anymore. I can't say the rate of this chocolate production is five chocolates per hour. I can say the rate in the first hour was 300 pounds per hour. But the rate in the third hour was 100 pounds per hour. So I actually have to qualify that and now talk about rates at specific times or specific time intervals. I just can't talk about the overall rate of the reaction because it changes. It's not constant anymore. But I can use the same techniques. It turns out I can take any point I want on this curve and I can find its slope. Remember, you find the slope by taking the tangent to the curve. That's not a perfect line. But I draw that line and I can find the slope of that line and that would tell me the rate there. But if I wanted the rate down here, I'd take a tangent to that line. And you can tell those have very different slopes. Right? The first line has a very large slope, the second line has a smaller slope. And that would be that slope 
would be the rate. Right? It would be in change in chocolate over change in time, delta chocolate over delta t. That's really, really cool. So we can still use the slope as an indicator of our rate, but we have to be a little more specific and say, I want it in this time interval or at this exact time. So here's an actual set of data from, you know, real chemicals. We've got this reaction now, and we're taking H2 and I2 and producing two HIs. It's the friendliest reaction in the world. When it's done, it says, hi. Okay. So what does this look like? Well, this looks like what we just did, right? We've got this curve that we're using up our H2 in green here. And it's very quick at the beginning, and it flattens out over time. And we've got this curve in red here, which is the production of HI, very steep at the beginning, flattening out over time. And what they did here is they picked a point at about 50 seconds and said, hey, let's find the rate of reaction at 50 seconds. And so we say, okay, look, we decided that the rate was delta of whatever, the concentration over delta T. And we said, hey, there was a negative when we were talking about reactants because notice we went down by 0.28 molar, right? We lost reactant, delta concentration was uh, negative and we always want a positive rate. So let's do that for the top one. So negative change in rate of, change of concentration of H2 over T, right? And that's just this, it's point, hello, it's 0.28, there we go over 40. So we're going to say negative, negative, negative 0 0.28 molar over 40 seconds. I'm going to go ahead and punch that in my calculator. 0.28 divided by 40 gives me 0 0.007. Um, I'm going to assume I probably got at least one more sig fig, sig fig there, and it's going to be molar per second. So that is my rate at 50 seconds. And we should find, right, that the rate should be the same for the other one. Because remember, we said the rate we're producing stuff should be the rate that we're using it up. And so if we calculate the same thing for the HI, we're going to use the positive now. We're going to say rate for HI is going to be the change in concentration of HI over the change in T. And we're going to say, well, let, let, let's look over here. They gave us that number. 0.56 molar was our change over T, was still 40 seconds. And so what do we get? We get 0 0.014, hmm, wait, that's not the same number. In one case, we got 0 0.007, and, and, and now we're getting 0 0.014. There's, there's something wrong, because we just talked for like, sheesh, I've been talking for 33 minutes. We just talked for 33 minutes about how this rate was equal, right, if you used up this. And now you're saying, well, here's some actual data from you know, real chemicals, and it's not true anymore. Well, welcome to stoichiometry. When we were talking about chocolate, we were talking about mass. We were talking about pounds, right? And we said, hey, if I'm using up 10 pounds of chocolate, I must be making 10 pounds of chocolate. But when we're talking about quantity, Right? Let's say we had um, Kit Kats. Kit Kats usually come in those pairs, right? And our job as a chemical reaction was to split the Kit Kats. Right? And so we took one Kit Kat, we split it in half, and we made two little bars. Well, if that took us a second, right? We used up one big thing of Kit Kat and we made two little bars of Kit Kat. So we made twice as many products as we used up. And if we did it again, right, we used a second bar, then we now have four little Kit Kat bars, like little bunnies. Okay, four little Kit Kat bars. And so we made twice as many bars as we used up. And that can happen when you have stoichiometry. That can happen when you have chemical reactions, right? We have all these numbers that we put in front of our stoichiometry, and we say, hey, look, I am producing twice as many of those HIs as I am using up my H2. And so we actually now find that the rate is not the same for everything in a reaction. Oh, gosh, that messes things up, doesn't it? We don't want that. We don't want the rate to be different, right? We want this thing called a rate that's constant that we can talk about 
as fundamental to a reaction as it's going on and not as, well, you know, the rate for HI is this, the rate for I2 is this, the rate for this other thing. We don't want to do that. And so we're going to have to change maybe our definition a little bit to take into account that stoichiometry matters, that I'm producing two of these for every 1H2 I'm using, so I really am producing them twice as fast. In fact, that's what we do. So we don't just take the negative, we also take into account the stoichiometry. So as a general rule, we're going to see our generic reaction AA plus BB goes to CC plus DD. We're going to see this so many times in this class, you're going to get tired of it. But what we do, in order to take into account the stoichiometry, we don't just put that negative on the reactants and the positive on the products. We actually say, hey, let's put in the stoichiometry. So we always have this thing called rate. And it's going to be a constant, no matter whether I use A to calculate it, B to calculate it, C to calculate it, or D to calculate it. And here's how they get it to be a constant. For reactants, I'm still going to put that negative there because we're using it up and I want a positive rate. But now I'm going to divide by the stoichiometry. Right? So if I was making twice as many Kit Kat bars over here, if I divide that by two, ping, I, I'm now kind of making one to one, and so my rate would be positive. So this is going to be one over A times the change in concentration of A over the change in time. So I take into account the stoichiometry. And that should be the exact same rate as if I used B to calculate it. Right, notice my little b for the stoichiometry and my big b for the concentration. I get the exact same rate value. I should not get a different value. If you go back to that last slide, 0 0.014 divided by 2, the stoichiometry for HI, gets me 0 0.007, which is what I had for my other one. Not only can we do that for our reactants, we can do that for our products too. So this is still on the same line. This is all still equal to each other. It's not a new thing. This is 1 over C times the change in concentration of C with time, or 1 over D times the change in concentration of D over time. This is a really useful equation, because what it tells us is that we can calculate the rate, whether we know only something about A, only something about B, only something about C, or only something about D. Or if we want to, we can calculate something about D if we know something about C and the rate. So there's lots of different ways of using these to actually do some calculations that allow us to compare rates and changes of concentration. But we have this one thing that there's the rate of reaction, Again, we have to phrase that that sometimes it's the rate at this point in time, right? When we have rates that change, when we have those curves, we say, oh, the rate at 50 seconds is this, the rate at 150 seconds is this. But that rate, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about A, B, C, or D, any of the reactants, any of the products, it's going to be the same because we calculate it using these stoichiometric things down here. All right, we're almost there. Almost to the end of this video. This is another long one. So, We've got this reaction. It's 2A, 3B goes to 2C plus D. And we're saying, hey, at a given moment in time, delta A over delta T is negative 1.0 molar per second. It's negative, why? Because we're using up A, right? Negative when we use up something. At that same moment, right? Now that we have possibility of reactions changing, we have to specify something about time. At that same moment, what is delta B over delta T? So again, this is your chance to answer. Try to figure out that calculation based on this equation that you saw for the general case and see if you can figure out what is delta B over delta T. All right, what did you come up with? Well, let's look at it. We know that the rate is negative 1 over A times the concentration change of A over delta T. And we know that's equal to negative one-third change in concentration of B over delta T. So <clears throat> what do we do? Well, we were told that delta A over delta T was minus one molar per second. So minus one over A, little a is two, times delta A over delta T. That's going to be minus 1.0 molar per second. Then that's going to be equal to minus one-third times delta concentration of B over delta T. Right. 
How do I solve for delta V delta T? I multiply by a negative three over one. And so I get three halves times a negative 1.0 molar per second is equal to delta B over delta T. The three halves is positive because I canceled this negative with this negative, but I was still left with that negative. So I kept the negative on the molar, but I canceled the ones in front of the one third and the one half. So I get three halves times negative one, it's gonna be a negative 1.5 molar per second. And so hopefully you got D. Whew. All right, that's how we can relate these. We can find out concentration changes of one thing by knowing concentration changes of another thing. So that's our introduction to kinetics. What we're gonna worry about moving on is how can we use that to calculate some rates? So we'll do some more examples. And then how can we get that out of our data? How can we extract something from our data about the reaction itself? Thanks for listening, bye.